Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Surviving Scientology Radio with your host, Jeffrey Augustine. Today, we have on with us the one and only Tony Ortega. Tony, welcome to the show. Hey, Jeffrey. What's going on? A lot is going on, man. That's what's going. That's what's happening. Tony, on your underground bunker, the one, the famous, world-famous underground bunker, on June 17, 2021, you had a headline, Private Investigators Stalking Leah Remini and Jennifer Lopez, The Complete Text. Now, this is very fascinating because you have text messages from a court case in New York in which private investigators were following Jennifer Lopez and Leah Remini while they were together in New York. Can you give listeners the background of how you got the text, what happened? Yeah, this is a wild case. I know you've been interested in it as well. And uh, I've actually been uh, looking into this for months now. Uh, There's a really bizarre lawsuit happening in New York. And I'll try quickly to summarize it. Basically, you have a wealthy couple, uh, David Smith and Suzanne Goldsmith, who separated and were suing each other. They were suing for divorce, but they were each suing the other. It's a wild set of allegations. And of course, the New York Post thought this was great, these wealthy people suing each other. And um, at one point, Uh, David Smith was concerned that his wife was trying to get out of a prenup, and so he was advised, you need to uh, keep an eye on her because he believed that she was using uh, the excuse of a disability to not work and get out of her prenup. So he, on, on advice, he hired this private investigation firm to follow his wife or, you know, what was supposed to be soon as it'd be his ex-wife, 24 hours a day for weeks and weeks. So they had all these ex-cops following Suzanne day and night, day and night. And then at some point, David and Suzanne reconciled. And when they started comparing notes, they realized that this surveillance had really gone off the rails, that uh, these investigators had been uh, cooking the books in order to uh, overbill David, and this is their allegation. Uh, this has not been adjudicated in court yet. I want to make that plain. Um, and Suzanne claimed that five of these ex cops who were following in her and were supposed to be keeping their distance were all ended up in uh, intimate uh, encounters with her, uh, partying with her in, in nightclubs and making out with her. And two of them, she claims, raped her. So as they began to sue these private investigators and this private investigation firm together, they managed to get the iCloud texts of one of these ex-cops. His name is Yanti Green. He also goes by Michael or Mike. Yanti Michael Green. He's a retired New York police detective. And the Smiths managed to get the contents of his phone, even though he claimed that you know, the court had ordered him to turn in his phone multiple times. He had not done it. And then at the last minute when he was supposed to turn it in, he claimed it was stolen by a burglar. Uh, and the the phone is now missing, supposedly. But the Smiths were able to get his texts off of the Apple iCloud. And uh, I started hearing about what was on these texts because not only were there all these texts about following uh, Suzanne, it turns out that this same public and private investigations firm had also worked for other clients, including tailing Leah Remini for the Church of Scientology. I'd heard about this, uh, and we were really interested in getting a hold of these texts, but of course the private investigations firm was fighting it tooth and nail in court. And you can understand why, because they don't want their secrets getting out to the public. But the Smiths managed finally to submit those texts in a court document that was briefly public in a court in Nassau County on Long Island. And uh, we managed to get a copy. Uh, The judge subsequently sealed those. I think they might be available again. But they were only available for a few days. And they're stunning. I mean, they're amazing. These texts show that these guys were following Leah Remini and Jennifer Lopez while they were in New York filming Second Act. Now, the funny thing for me personally 
was that uh, back in 2017, when this was happening, late 2017, Leah was in in New York. She was she was filming scenes for Kevin Can Wait out in Long Island um, for that CBS series with uh, with um, oh, Kevin uh, James, Kevin, Jay, Kevin yeah. James, right? And then she was also coming into Manhattan late at night to film scenes with with Jennifer Lopez for their movie. And she, at that time, she told me, she said, Tony, I'm being followed. And, and this guy that was following them was pretty reckless. And she told me about this guy in a silver van with Texas plates that had almost gotten them into a car accident. This guy was so aggressively uh, following him. And we managed to get a tip at this time. This is back in early 2018. We got a tip that this was this ex-cop and ex-New York police detective named Mike Green. And at that time, I Je- Jeffrey, I called this guy. Uh, and this was just based on a tip from a witness. I called this guy, and he denied it. He denied that he was following Leah Remini. He denied that he even knew who she was. And I said, come on. A New York police detective doesn't know King of Queens? And he's like, oh, no, I, I work too hard. I, 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 don't, I don't watch television, right? It just sounded bogus, okay? Sure. But, but I, when I wrote that story back in March of 2018, um, I didn't name him because I didn't, have, I didn't have enough evidence to name him in the story, but I did put in his responses to my phone call. Well, it also in these texts were these private investigators talking about that story. And calling me names and saying this whole story was untrue and everything. So it was fascinating to see all this stuff. And so I actually wrote a story for the Daily Beast about this whole situation and about how these texts have come out. And that, um, you know, Leah Remini was being followed. Jennifer Lopez was being followed. But I know the thing that you're really interested in is uh, in the lead of my story in Daily Beast, I pointed out that when um, one of the private investigators, Saul Roth, came to Mike Green one of these late nights in December 2017 said, hey, what's the job? What are we doing? And Mike said, we're, fo- we're following Leah Remini. And he had to explain who that was to her because, of course, Mike Green, of course, knew who she was. He'd been lying to me. Um, and, and Scientology came up. And Saul, Saul Roth indicated that he'd done a quick Google check to see that you know, at that time, late 2017, you'll remember, was like the end of her second season of Scientology in the Aftermath. There was all kinds of press about Leah Remini in her big battle with the Church of Scientology. And so Saul Ross said, oh, she left. And then Mike Green says to Saul Roth in a text, yes, word is they want to kill her. And, you know, so naturally that was the lead of my daily beast story and it was the pull quote but you brought up a great question i, I know we want to talk about in this podcast and, and that was how does a private investigator a former new york police detective take part in a surveillance job if he has reason to believe that his client is gathering information on the target because they want to kill her doesn't that bring up a lot of ethical questions for a private investigator? Tony, you hit the, the core issue. And, and for our listeners, I want to let them know I am a licensed private investigator in the state of California. So as a private investigator, when you read a piece of evidence that says, yeah, word is they want to kill her, meaning Leah Remini, the first thing any investigator, particularly police investigator, private investigator, ask is, well, Mr. Green, you say, and I can see this playing out in a court of law or an interrogation room. You say that you had knowledge that there was an organized plot to murder Leah Remini. Explain. Where did you hear it? Who told you? Did your client tell you? Did they hire underworld types? Are you connected to La Cosa Nostra? You're in New York. You were a New York cop. It raises all kinds of questions you want to ask Yanti Mike Green. And it's actually quite terrifying that he claims to have knowledge of a plot to kill Leah Remini. So, yeah, of course, that's, that's, that's been reported. And um, a couple things should happen immediately. 
couple things should happen immediately. If Mike Green, as a retired New York City police detective, had knowledge of a murder plot, he should have reported it to the New York Police Department, the Federal Bureau of Investigation. He should have reported it to the owner of the agency, Dan Ribikoff. He should have made this widely known. And that's at a point where the owner of the agency pulls out of the case if he knows of a murder plot and reports it to the police. See, I have an obligation as a private investigator. If I, beca- if I became aware of a murder plot, the first people I would go to was the police department. I would also warn the target or the subject of the investigation. At that point, you would have a duty to warn Leah's people, Leah and her people, that, hey, I heard this. I've contacted the police. I'm pulling out of the investigation. So that raises all kinds of red flags about ethics, the law. What did you know? And um, it's a very serious criminal charge, Tony. I'm sorry, a very serious criminal allegation. And and Mike didn't follow up on it. Why? Yeah, you know, and like I said, uh, in 2018, I called him up when I, all I knew at that time was that a car that we believed he was dry, driving was following Leah Remini and, and uh, had almost caused an accident. And we also believed he had told a, a third party that he was following her for the Church of Scientology. And when I asked him in 2018 about that, he denied that he even know, knew who she was. Now we have his texts from that period where he's explaining to another PI This is who we're following. It's Leah Remini from the King of Queens. She's shooting a film with her friend Jennifer Lopez. He clearly knew who she was and was lying to me a few months later when we spoke on the phone. So now I call him again, right? So now I have his texts. Yeah. And I called him up and spoke to him uh, just before my Daily Beast story came out. And um, and I I I got him on the phone. I said, I I don't know if you remember me. Uh, but, uh, I spoke to you three years ago and now your texts have been entered into this court case and you clearly knew who Jennifer Lopez was. And, and that, you know, it looks like you were following over the church of Scientology this time. He's, he, he, he disparaged the Smiths who are suing him and says that the Smiths and their attorneys are lying about everything. And he doesn't even know if those are really his texts or not. Now, I got to tell you, there's a document in the lawsuit showing that all of the attorneys, including Greens, stipulated that these are his texts from his iCloud account. So there's just no question that these are his texts. But his, you know, again, I don't know, is this is this what they teach them at the New York Police Department? I, I, I hate to assume anything negative about the finest police force in, the, in America, but here's this guy just bald-facedly out just outrageously lying to my face for the second time the first time he lied that he didn't know who Jenner, uh, the, who leah remedy was this time he's lying that it's not his text and and you know i just i just saw him in, in court again last week i went to another hearing and i can tell you that he put on another uh show like that there where the guy he's amazing i mean i, I i've been doing this for 25 25- years, Jeffrey, and I have never had anyone, cop or not cop, lie to me so openly and so badly as Yanti Mike Green. It, it's fascinating to me. I, I'm stunned and fascinated. Yeah. It, you, you know, Tony, when you're when you're doing uh, investigative journalism, you get lied to. When you're working as a private investigator, you get lied to. Police get lied to. Right. Right, but, but this seems th- this is extraordinary for a couple reasons. Once, when uh, Mike Green said his phone went missing, they recovered the phone, and he he had erased text messages. Is the uh, allegation correct? So uh, uh, this the Smiths hired a forensic expert and recovered the information off off the iCloud his his iCloud account, and. Th- in the divorce case, these texts play in. A couple things that happen that go to the character of, of the other investigation in the in the divorce case. And this is where I get the whole firm becomes hard to believe, Tony. That the firm put three people on to follow Suzanne Goldsmith. Okay, three PIs. These are it was far- more like seven or eight because well, no, it was 24 no, hours a day for no, weeks. Okay, but at the beginning for each shift, yeah. at the beginning... There were three 
PIs following Suzanne Goldsmith. I'm going to explain a little bit about following people uh, just to, to educate the listeners. This is pretty interesting. When private investigators follow people, they will rent a car. You never use your own car, right? Because you, right, right. So you, you rent. Even if you get a license plate and it goes to Hertz, rent a car, you can't get who rented the car without a court order. Okay. okay. And you normally rent nondescript cars, like you rent a gray Prius, a white Camry, just nondescript stuff that doesn't stand out. These are supposed to be veteran cops who are retired from the force and know how to do following people. With three people, you should never lose a client. They told their boss, Ribikoff, that Suzanne kept eluding them. <laughs> My first thinking, if I had, if I were following, a, 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 you know, a subject with three people, you, you, you set up a, like a, a triangle and, you know, you do a lead follow. There's, there's all kinds of techniques. You should not lose people. They said they needed a five man zone to follow one woman, that she was so good at evasive driving and maneuver and they would lose her. Therefore, they needed five, and then they needed eight people. Then they needed, they just needed a crazy amount of people to follow one woman. That's yeah, well, insane. In, in court papers, David Smith alleges that he spent $8.8 million on this operation to follow his wife. And his allegation in their law, in the lawsuit is that this was double, you know, he, that, that they were, they were padding the books basically and, and double and billing a uh, triple billing him for things. Sure. And I have no, listen, Jeffrey, I have no opinion on that. I'm not, you know, I'm interested in that case, but yeah. uh, what's more interesting to me is just how these, you know, what these investigators did and which is reflected in the texts. Well, well to you, I, I, all I'm talking about is excess billing goes to the character of someone who would lie. That's all I'm saying. If you're going to lie about this, what else are you lying about? You know, what else are you lying about? Well, those aren't my texts. No, no, they are your texts. And so he's obviously covering up because he sees liability for himself. He's covering up, but it doesn't answer the question. What knowledge does Mike Green and or his associates have of a plot to kill Leah Remini? That question remains unanswered. He he should at least be asked that question. And you know, perhaps he will be in this, you know, if this case ever comes to trial, I have a feeling it'll probably be settled at some point, but um, he should at least be asked that question. But like I said, I just saw him in court last week and this guy, I mean, you know, did you sign this document? Uh, I guess I did. I mean, you know, it's just, it's an act and I don't think it would go very well with a jury, but they don't have a jury at this point yet. But I mean, every single thing isn't this your document didn't you sign this aren't these your texts i mean he just sits there and uh that looks like my signature uh i guess it could be i mean you're just like come on dude you know just it's 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 stunning and i you know and the, the stuff that they presented in court last week was equally outrageous man well what did what they present what were some of the other things well part of the case is that um you know, Suzanne's allegation is that he raped her. And what's really stunning, and the New York Post reported this, um, his response is that she raped him. This is this, this this apparent this supposedly happened in the back of a car at two o'clock in the morning after he'd been following her for hours and drinking with her or something. And I mean, I saw this guy in court last week. He's like six three. He's this big dude. Um, she's this tiny little thing. And um, every time the her attorney was asking him about this text that you sent or the video you made of the rape, he would always answer, "You mean when she attacked me?" I mean, it was it was very it was theater in court last week. Let me tell sure. you. Sure, yeah, rehearsed. But here here's the thing that's out. It's, it's amazing. So it's not just the text. He they don't disagree that. At two o'clock in the morning in May 2018, in the back of this car, sex happened or or, or or something something happened between this man and this woman in this car. And whatever happened, he videoed it on his iPhone. And so when they got a court order, turn over your phone, he was supposed to turn over these videos. Well, what he did was he turned over in uh uh, two very short videos, one that's like 30 seconds long 
and one that's a minute and a half long. And I want to say right now, I have not seen either one of these. But he claims that these small, very short videos are proof that she attacked him. Well, then the iPhone got lost or stolen. And so they called in an expert who got the original videos off of the iCloud. And he said they actually total up to 13 minutes. There's 13 minutes in two videos that he just took a small percentage of to show the court earlier. And I don't know what's, Jeffrey, I have not seen either one of those videos, but I will tell you that what was testified to in court last week was this expert who has seen the originals and has seen what Mike Green turned in testified last week that one of the audio moments that Mike Green removed from the video he did submit had him saying, get ready, here it comes. Oh, Jesus Christ. That's that's called blooded. And that's that is court testimony last week, Nassau Supreme Court. An expert said Mike Green had removed audio of himself saying that from the video he did turn in, which is just, like I said, about a total of about two minutes out of a total of about 13 minutes that he took. So, I mean, I'm just I'm just sitting there in courtroom like I can't believe I, I'm the only reporter in there, by the way, when, you know, this former New York police detective, there's evidence that he's covering up this whatever really happened and i don't know i'm just I, i'm just sitting there going why why is this not a news story what's going on this is the guy that was following leah remedy and you know i'm gonna keep tracking it i'm 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 hoping to get even more evidence about what's going on and i'm happy to talk to dan ribikoff the the owner of the uh investigations firm i did talk to him briefly for my daily beast story he denied that the church of scientology had hired him um, and I and I talked to Mike Green. I'll talk to them again. I'm just stunned that there's not more of an investigation going on uh, about what happened in that car that night. Sure, and there and and there, and there are in the uh, there, there's David Smith's case. A couple of points I want to raise. He hired them. The husband hired them for covert surveillance, and that specifically means covert. The subject of the investigation is to not know they're being followed. That's the whole point of covert investigation. And at some point, the allegation made by David Smith, the husband, is that Yanti Green suggested, why don't I make contact with the subject, Suzanne Goldsmith, and it'll make it easier. And that he approaches her and says, hey, if you cooperate with us, this will go, this will be easier on all of us. Now, you're never supposed to, as a private investigator, make contact with the subject. And that was, as I understand it, in the contractual language when David Smith hired these guys. Right. And I and, and I, I can understand why the two sides might uh, go, you know, talk about this, because this, the, the situation at that point, as I understand it, is that they the private investigators claimed that Suzanne was trying to evade them. And so it made things really a hassle. And they just went up to her and said, look, we're going to follow you no matter where you go. Why don't you just cooperate? And at that point she said, okay, just, you know, I'm going to dinner. You guys want to follow me and that's fine. And I can, you know what, as ridiculous, sort of ridiculous as that sounds, I can, I can imagine, I can imagine that happening, but it's the next step that is like, okay, so you've decided that you're going to openly follow Suzanne to her dinner arrangement or whatever. That's fine. But then how do you end up partying with her and drinking with her and making out with her? I mean, that's the part that's just mind blowing. And it's not just Mike Green. She's alleging this five separate private investigators on this detail ended up having some kind of intimate contact with her. I mean, it's mind blowing. Well, t Tony, and it gets worse because... As, the, as David Smith's lawsuit makes clear, they never ran it by the client. They never said to David Smith, hey, we want to make direct contact with your wife as PIs hired by you. They withheld that from him. And therefore, when they made contact with her, they withheld that knowledge from the client. And when they went out drinking, dancing, 
they charge the client as they charge the client those expenses and yeah. there's even this little argue there's even this little discussion in the text messages like hey i'm going to run a range rover i'm going to run an infinity they started living the high life you're supposed to economize for a client if you have legitimate expenses okay but if you were going to make in other words if someone hired me to follow their spouse and they made a strict rule at the beginning there is to be no contact as covert I have to tell them, hey, look, why don't I try to make contact? They withheld that knowledge from David Smith. That's his allegation in his complaint. Right, right. Okay. And and like why the hell that's just a violation. That 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 should cost them their license, in my opinion, right? Because you can't do that. You have to inform the client of what's going on. And the client's alleging he withheld uh, and Senator Alphonse Diamato's ex-wife is involved in this because she was going out with Suzanne, you know, to nightclubs. And one of the PIs became romantically involved with her. And as part of the complaint, complaint states, they were acting like drunken frat boys. There's allegations that they were using cocaine on the job. They were drinking on the job. I mean, like, if you're out on a case and you want to have a drink in a nightclub and it's a cover, that's no big deal. But you cross the line with cocaine. And so there's so many things that aren't right about these guys. And it goes to, for me, it goes to the caliber of the PIs that the Church of Scientology is willing to hire. <laughs> because there's good PIs and there's bad PIs, just like there's good cops and bad cops. Majority of PIs are very good. Majority of cops are very good. And I'll tell you something that, that, that PIs do. I just helped find a missing person, Tony. Uh, I, someone's daughter had gone missing for years and I helped find her hmm. and, and that brought healing and closure and it helped the family reunite. Wow. The daughter was living off the grid. I found stolen property. <laughs> One thing that PIs do that is very good in a murder case, a loved one's been murdered. The police, the case goes cold. The police move on to other cases. Retired homicide cops often solve cold cases and bring closure to the family and get the murderers convicted. So PIs can do very good things, but they can, <laughs> bad cops, bad PIs can do bad things, you know, and, and, and it's sort of like you, you have to look at, in the case of Ron Miscavige, God rest his soul, those PIs, when the West Dallas police rolled up on them and pulled them out at gunpoint, they had a silencer in their car, which is a federal felony. They had fake IDs, fake license plates an arsenal of weapons and ammunition. What are they doing? Yeah. And uh, Tony, uh, the first time I met you, we had a oh, occasion. That's right. The, that's first, right. the time first time we met was down in Texas. Yes. Ray Jeffrey was there. And the two PIs who followed Pat Broker for 25 years were there. And we got to talk to them. I, I had come down in the car with Ray and those two PIs. Yeah. And I got to interview them uh, on that long drive. And it was one of the greatest days I ever got to spend as a reporter was, uh, was interviewing those two guys that had followed Pat Broker for 24 years. And we ended up at Marty's house. Yeah. And there's Jeffrey Augustine. I was like, wow. And then not, not only not only were you there, not only was I there with Ray Jeffrey and the two PIs, the Channel 4 crew was there. Oh, I, I remember I was there and all these, car, <laughs> all, 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 all these cars roll up and I see you. I'm like, that's Tony Ortega because I don't have seen pictures of you. And then at one point, you know, I have to get vouched for that, you know, my I write under the pen name Jay Swift. Remember when we were upstairs, one of the PIs comes up and goes, hey, are you Jay Swift to me? Oh, wow. And he said, I read your stuff on Xenu.net. And yeah. I was like, you never know what's going to happen in real life. <laughs> and, but, but getting but those, to, yeah. Those guys, I have to say, um, I couldn't help liking them because they had, they had spent um, 24 years following Pat Broker and they took their job very seriously about never being seen. And uh, it was uh, Paul Merrick and um, uh, what was the other guy's name? Uh, Greg Arnold. Greg Arnold and yeah. Paul Merrick. Great guys. And they they had spent all this time and their, their number one rule was um, that 
Pat Broker could never know they were following him. And uh, uh, look, I don't, I wouldn't want Paul Merrick and Greg Arnold following me around. It's, I, I still, you know, it's still a very highly questionable job. But they, they, they took it seriously that they were not going to interfere well, they, with they, the guy's they, life, and they weren't going to pose a threat to him. They just were just, they just want to watch him. No, and and I talked to them, and and they did take their job seriously. And I, I, a couple interesting things. Uh, one of them told me they, they both had like legitimate cover jobs. And, uh, and this was before the settlement came and they signed anything so we can talk about it. One of them said his job that he took is, you know, these, these mobile windshield repair guys that go out and, re- you know, fix your yeah. window. Okay. He had a job as a mobile windshield repair as a cover. And the other guy had a similar type of job. And I don't know if it was detailing cars or something, but they both had like legitimate day jobs that would, you know, allow them to go around town. Now I asked one of them and I won't say which one, but I asked, I said, did you ever call David Miscavige directly? He said, yes. And I'd say, when you call him, what did he say? He said, all you'd pick up the phone and say, what do you got for me? And there was testimony that he called David Miscavige directly. Yeah. Which the church denied. But yeah, he 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 said that's what David Miscavige would say. That's what I would say. What do you got for me? Yep. So he would give a daily intelligence briefing of what uh, of what Pat Broker was up to. Right. Now, now these guys were straightforward, long term assignment. You couldn't ask for a better job to you know PI job. That's just straightforward. And they made a lot of money too. Yeah, yeah. And and when when the church decided they didn't need to follow Pat around anymore, they sacked them and they said, "Wait a minute, we're entitled to retirement." And the church said, "Go to hell." And that's when the lawsuit happened. It it, it wasn't because the church didn't want to follow Pat anymore. That's not what happened. The problem no. the problem was when they did the um, Truth Rundown series in the Tampa Bay Times, St. Petersburg Times back then. Marty, one of the things Marty said to uh, uh, the guys at the, at the Tampa Bay Times was um, there's a he told he talked about the mit operation without naming Paul and Greg. Hmm. He gave an he gave an interview uh, where he said uh, to Joe Childs and Tom Tobin, where he said that, yeah, you know, we followed one guy for 20 years. There were a couple of ex-cops and. Their whole job was never to be seen. Marty described the operation without identifying it. And so at that point, they in Miscavige's mind, they had been made. Oh, okay. Yeah. You thank see you. what I'm saying? Yeah. Thank you for refreshing my memory. And so yes. that's why that's why he fired them at that point, because they were no longer useful to him. I have no doubt that Pat Broker is still being followed day in and day out today it's just that they've been paul and greg were replaced by a couple of other ex-cops and you're right that's a plum assignment so it's just that somebody else has that now okay and and i'm glad you and i'm glad you uh explained that uh and what's interesting what's interesting here is that um these long-term you know long-term surveillance of people really has no legitimate reason I have argued other no. than other than it serves now here here's my argument that I've made. The Church of Scientology spends tax exempt dollars that inure to the benefit of David Miscavige's paranoia. Paying for PIs for twenty five years, thirty five years only inures to the benefit of Miscavige's paranoia because he's afraid that Pat Broger could appear in national media and topple him from the throne. Tell the whole story. I mean it doesn't it's not religious tax exempt dollars should not be spent on decades of surveillance of private individuals who've left the church. No, it's outrageous. And and it, also it the fact the fact that he was paying ten thousand a week cash to Dwayne and Daniel Powell to follow his own father, Ron Miscavige, around in Wisconsin is just totally outrageous well, that well, that's it, what Scientology does with its tax exempt money. Well, it should serve as a basis into a hearing for revo- revoking the Church of Scientology's tax exemption. And this, la- this, this latest case where uh, Yanti Mike Green claims the word is, word is where? Word is on the streets that they want to kill Leah Remini. That should serve as a basis because a church should not be involved in an organized murder campaign. So, Tony, something else I noticed I want to talk about in the discussions between Roth and Green 
when they're following Jennifer Lopez and Leah Remini, they bring up the fact in their text that they have to go to the bathroom. One of them has to go to the bathroom, right? Now, when you're on a stakeout, and I've been on stakeouts, you have to go to the bathroom. But here, here's another line they crossed. When you retire from the New York Police Department, I went in and read the New York Police Department uh, Police Union retirement rules. You turn in your shield or your badge. You turn in your ID, okay? And that's a big deal. Yeah. But the one guy said, hey, just flash your shield and walk in the Four Seasons and use their bathroom. Well, you're not supposed to be carrying an NYPD shield. Yeah. If you're retired from the department, you have to turn it in. So that's an interesting question. It's another thing to ask him is, what are you flashing exactly? Yeah. And let me and let me tell you something that you know Leah was really that was the one thing that I think bugged Leah the most, and she talked to me about this a little bit, uh, and I put it in my draft of my Daily Beast story, but it didn't make the uh, published version. I'll tell you what she said to me though. She was particularly upset about that because when. It, um, it was actually the Ritz Carlton um, residences on Long Island is where she was staying uh, again while she was uh, taping scenes with um, J Lo in Manhattan and when she was taping Kevin Can Wait scenes in Long Island. And so she had this real nice bungalow or whatever. And she was explaining to me that if anyone came to visit her, even her own husband, the guard people at the guard gate would accompany them down to her place and you couldn't just walk into the place right and and she said in fact one night uh there was a storm and the wind blew her patio doors open which set off an alarm and the alarm was connected to the local police and the local police showed up at the guard gate even that police officer responding to an alarm had to be escorted to leah's place so she wanted me to understand nobody is supposed to get into that residence area without being escorted. And so she just finds it amazing and, and really troubling that Yanti Mike Green is talking about flashing his badge and getting in there so he can use the bathroom. Oh, that's an outstanding point, Tony. And, and I appreciate you laying the context because if you're flashing a badge and impersonating a police officer, that's a crime in and of itself. We don't know exactly what happened, but he does make the remark, flash your badge. He now, does. So I find that that stood out to me. The other thing that they mentioned is they pay the paparazzi to find out the whereabouts of J-Lo and Jennifer, uh, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Jennifer Lopez and Leah. They're paying right. paparazzi. Now that shows you paparazzis are willing to take money to do anything. You know, uh, I also wonder who else they're paying because, you know, on the set, you see there's evidence that they had the the actual documents. Yeah, the call from, sheets. They had yeah. the call sheets. Yeah, Leah was upset about that, too, yeah. that they, they clearly had people in the productions that were feeding them information. Now, this shows you why Scientology has reach. Through PIs, you pay off some bribe money to someone on a set to get the call sheets. Yeah. You know, at time. And, and, and that crosses a line violates union rules. It violates all kinds of privacy rules, but it shows that they're willing to spend money on the street. So that's why if he's paying paparazzi, if he's paying someone on the set for call sheets, you know, how does he hear word? Where does he hear it from? Is he connected as an ex cop to the underworld? That would be my suspicion. That's purely conjecture on my part. But and that, I and, and look, I look, I'm a reporter. I'm trying to get information. I'm not going to knock people for doing what they can to get information. But I would just like to see a church, the Church of Scientology, be asked by a government agency to please explain why they are paying all this money, tax exempt money, to private investigators who are paying paparazzi who are getting call sheets. And movie sets. I mean, it's one thing if somebody's trying to get a picture for the Daily Mail, but it's another thing is why is something that calls itself a church going to these ends to keep track of Leah Remini in the middle of the night in Manhattan? I mean, it just makes no sense. It's it's a disturbing uh, but w very consistent picture of what the Church of Scientology does to the people it considers enemies. Yeah, and there's a deliberate attempt to intimidate Leah Remini. 
Because when you do covert investigations, you're invisible, right? Now, Hubbard said, called in some cases for a noisy investigation where you let the subject know they're being followed. They are being investigated, right? So there's, 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 it's just wrong on a lot of reasons. And it's illegal to intimidate, to deliberately intimidate somebody uh, because that's, that crosses the line into psychoterrorism, intimidation, threat. Does it cause her to be in fear for her life and her safety? Yes. The answer is yes. To your point, that should be investigated because the church should not spend 501c3 tax-exempt dollars from religious parishioners on non-religious purposes of psychoterrorism. I'd just like to see him be asked the question, Jeffrey. You know, we've been exactly we keep bringing these things up, and you know, I think it's pretty easy for our readers and listeners to see how outrageous it is that Scientology is paying a couple of ex cops for 24 years to follow one man simply because David Miscavige fears what might happen if that guy opens his mouth, and that you know, David Miscavige is paying ten thousand dollars a week to a couple of ex cops to follow around his own father. And then he's spending outrageous amounts of money to have these ex NYPD cops follow around Leah Remini. I think people that read our story see how outrageous this it is. But I want a government agency simply to ask the Church of Scientology, how is this possibly well, let's make a, it- a part of your role as a as a religious organization? Well, let's try to make it happen, and I'll tell you how. Because when I when I interview with Mike and Leah on their show, I was talking about the GPB capital holdings. Yeah. $1.8 billion Ponzi-like scheme in New York City, Scientologist David Gentile arrested by the FBI. Leah asked me, how does this go toward stopping the Church of Scientology? And and I'll and, and I want to, can I answer that real quickly? Sure. 17,000 people invested with GPB capital and were taken for $1.8 billion. You can bet all of their friends, all of their families, everyone they know, could go to hundreds of thousands of people, know that they were swindled. And these were a lot of older people, and that was their life savings for retirement they can't make back. So that's attrition of reputation. A Scientologist swindled me. The second thing, the Department of Justice filed a civil action and a criminal action. David Gentile was arrested by the FBI. And you can bet that if the Department of Justice arrested him, that the IRS... And the IRS criminal investigation knows about this case. I can guarantee you they know about this case. Say no more on that. On my blog, the Scientology Money Project, if you go to the top header, it says report Scientology to the IRS. And what I'd like everyone listening to this is to go to ScientologyMoneyProject.com, click on the top row. It says report Scientology to the IRS. Basically, I have the form 13909. And I'm going to do, uh, when you post this on your blog, we'll do a report. And I'll give the information on how everyone can send in a complaint about this event to the IRS and ask them to investigate this matter. Because I think if we put a lot of political pressure, popular pressure into this particular event on a form uh, 13909, the IRS has to respond to you. Normally, you'll get a form letter saying we've received your complaint, but we're looking into it. So I'd like to put pressure on getting a government agency to to ask the church about this, but also Mr. Yanti Mike Green about this. Where did he hear it? So I I think you cannot underestimate the power of the press, the media, to push this to the government for action and ask for action. Ask the Attorney General of the United States. Ask the IRS Commissioner. Ask the IRS Commissioner exempt organizations. So I believe in never giving up. And I believe we can do it. And and I've always thought that the church won't go down through a direct appeal to the IRS, but it'll be through criminal means, perhaps even through racketeering and RICO. But it's stuff like this, Tony, that adds up. And you keep documenting it and documenting it, and it builds, and the government has to look at it. So I believe we should never get up, give up or be discouraged, but we should redouble our efforts. At this. Well, well, like I said, I, I would just like to see the government ask the question. But I know Good. that, you know, something that Mike has said, Mike Rinder has said that, you know, they they know, the government knows full well that just asking the question would, would put them into a years-long fight 
with the Church of Scientology. And, you know, the IRS has has been, you know, in bad shape in recent years. Um, maybe the scariest thing David Miscavige uh, has heard this year was recent reports that our new president is has said he's going to beef up the IRS. That that might that might be something that worries David Miscavige that the IRS may finally have some resources. Um, I I don't know. I, I you know it's it seems like the government has more than enough evidence already to simply ask the question. You know, sure. what, how can you justify spending tax exempt money? on following people around with these expensive private investigations. And, uh, you know, this, this Leah Remini one is just the most outrageous recent one, but there are others going on and will continue to go on because, you know, Jeffrey, it's one of the fascinating things about the Church of Scientology is that it has to follow the policies of L. Ron Hubbard. And between 1955 and 1967, Hubbard wrote down all of these aggressive litigious surveillance policies. And now that he's dead, they just don't believe that they can alter them. And they just have to keep following the same playbook year after year after year. Uh, and it's just a matter of, you know, when are we going to find their late, you know, most recent outrageous one? Because yeah, they're not going to follow Ron Miscavige anymore because sadly he passed away. But I can tell you they're following someone else right now. And we may not find out about it for a while, but we're going to eventually. Sure. Sure. And when, uh, you know, I've had, uh, Karen and I have had five private investigators from Scientology show up at our home over the years. And here's one thing I want everyone listening to know about. Private investigators are not police officers. They are private citizens. They have no law enforcement power. Do not be intimidated by them at all. They can't do anything to you. If anything, take their picture and post it on the internet. That's what private investigators do not like, are their pictures and names posted on the internet. And you, well, now now that we know what happened with uh, Greg and Arnold and, and uh, 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 Paul Merrick, is once the, once you identify them, Miscavige doesn't want to have anything to do with them anymore. So you ruin their jobs. So that's the that's a very good thing is to identify them, put the picture out there. Uh, the Scientology will probably not hire them anymore after that. Yeah, in a name if possible. I'll tell you an interesting. Uh, you remember the late Jim Lynch, Freedom Magazine reporter? Of course. Okay, he he shows up here one time, uh, 2013. Don't hold yeah. me to the year, and he's wanting to do a story for Freedom Magazine. You know, and, and, and Jim Lynch, he had a, he was not a big guy. He had a very slight presence, you know, um, you know, so he, he's not very physically imposing and he came out here and, uh, he was in his cheap suit, cheap shoes, like, like, uh, to that point I was court watching down in Texas and I saw Warren McShane in the same type of, you know, Scientology issue, cheap suit cheap shoes anyway I, I i go outside and i'm talking to, to jim and i'm just giving him the bums rush like why are why are you wasting your time you know working for this blood money cult i'm really mad because he shows up at my house but you know sure uh so i follow him out to his car and we're, we're chatting right and he's being driven by a private investigator it's a rented barracuda Jim gets in the car and the guy can't get out because two cars are blocking him. You've been on our street, you know, parking to get yeah. tight. Yeah. So I, I'm leaning and talking to the PI and I see he's carrying a gun. He's got a shoulder oh. holster with a weapon. Oh, man. Now, that's not illegal if he has a concealed carry permit. I'm sure he's retired law enforcement. He looked like it. And I said, why are you coming out to my house with a gun? Are you that scared? I'm not going out to your house with a gun. And, and I wouldn't. But the fact that, like, Jim Lynch needed an armed PI to go with him, I, I mean, this was just, if this was meant to scare me, it didn't. It, 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 it's outrageous conduct. And, you know, so, anyway, the guy, they, they leave, right? He speeds off. Another time uh, during the Squirrel Buster period, yeah. PIs came out to our house and the PI came up and wanted something and I sent him away. And I have a picture of it that I'll put on the blog, but they accidentally left the, 
the briefing books from Osa on the hood of the car as they drove away. And, and I was running after the car, hoping the Osa briefing books would fall off. I got a picture of it, <laughs> but it's like sometimes these detectives, if they're like the detectives here, they're not very organized and their mind is elsewhere. These Tony, these guys, Mike Green was making $50 an hour. The firm was charging 175 for his time. So at $50 an hour, you're going to get what you pay for, you know? Um, so <laughs> that's why these guys are partying and they, they get involved and they just, they're not good PIs. And, you know, you know? Jim, Lynch is, Jim Lynch is such a sad example because Jim was a legitimate journalist. He ran a newspaper in Illinois and I know he was uh, he ran it during some difficult times, and there was some people there that really respected him. He was a top editor for this this paper there, and uh, and he had left that and had ended up working for the Church of Scientology in Florida. And uh, he was actually asked about that, and um, at one point somebody asked a, 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 a former another journalist that had known him back in the day. He said, "You know, what are you doing?" And and he said, "Just don't call me Scientology shill." So. I made sure and, and and reminded him, you know, anyway, uh, he, he was definitely Scientology shill. But uh, he, in January 2013, he had showed up at your house and you snapped a very nice picture of him. Yep. And then after that, he was, he was assigned to me. And what astounded me was that he showed up at the home of a person who was part of my life here in New York City who didn't want to talk to him. And three days later, he was knocking on the door uh, of a person who had been close to me in, in California. So they were flying this guy all around the country to try to get information about me. And then just a couple months later, he died of cancer. Yeah. And uh, I, I just felt like, you know, what a waste of this guy's, you know, retirement or whatever that, that he would, he would give up a legitimate journalism job and there's video of him like getting in Mike Rinder's face and stuff. I mean, it was just such a what a uh, I don't like, understand. I guess people get desperate and want the money, but why? You know, you he had to know that what he was doing was so illegitimate. Sure, and it you know it 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 is tragic in one dimension to have your entire lifetime defined at the very end by the Church of Scientology. I mean that 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 becomes your legacy. And so people are, people are going to, um, well, it's like, uh, Jim Mars, he wrote alien agenda, which was a big 2004 book on extraterrestrials. And he had a following, he wrote books on the Kennedy assassination, but at the end of his life, because he needed the money, Jim Mars was pimping battlefield earth <laughs> writers of the future for the church of Scientology. Right. And, and to me, I didn't, I, I, his work was interesting. I didn't agree with it. Some of it was way over the top, but so Scientology tends to get these bottom feeders, especially in the arena of religious scholars. Need I say Massimo Introvigne, religious <laughs> horror, and the bad PIs. And Tony, I'm really, <clears throat> you do outstanding work as an investigative journalist and it is hard work. And I'm glad we have the underground bunker to cover what you're covering. And I think this, this story, I promise you, this is not the end of the story about the PIs who followed J-Lo and Leah Remini. It's not the well, end of the story. Well, you know, I think what this, talking to you, what this makes me think about, and I'm glad we, you brought, we wanted to talk about this subject today, is that, you know, what's really unique about Mike Green is that, there is a court case. Maybe it's not the thing we've been asking for all these years, an investigation by the Justice Department or the IRS or something. But there is an investigation going on. It's a couple of private people suing that firm. And what happened? The evidence got turned over. And it's all there in black and white, the disgusting things that they were doing for the Church of Scientology. And I just I hope people notice that because I think there's going to come a day when more evidence of what church, the Church of Scientology has been doing with private investigators 
is going to come out in litigation, in, in criminal prosecutions. And these former cops and former Justice Department people should really think twice. Do you really want to work for the Church of Scientology? Because you could end up like Yanti Mike Green and have everything spilled out in the open. Yeah. Yeah. A private investigator or a firm is free to pick and choose their clients. And you do you want to take that blood money? Do you want to take that blood money? The Church of Scientology in part depends on child labor, Tony, on the exploitation of Sea Org workers, on lying. Do you want to be part of that Scientology? Because it sticks. And when it goes bad, it goes really bad. And there were two PIs, the Powell's father and son team, who wound up face down on the asphalt with police guns drawn on them in West Dallas. And now the entire world knows. So, you, yeah, you, you raise a good point. Do you want to be part of that vicious machine? So, All right. Well, listen, I'm glad we got a chance to talk about this. And uh, it's, it's, uh, it's good to hear from a private investigator that there are boundaries and ethics and that, uh, you know, uh, that you see this guy as, as, as working beyond the pale. I do. I do see him as violating the, the ethics, the rules, the laws. I do see him that way. That's my opinion as a private investigator. Well, I hope he's going to, you know, face more questioning. I'm sure he will. There's another court date in August and I will be there. And, uh, you know, this, the, the, the litigation here again involves this bizarre situation between this husband and wife who were suing each other and are now reconciled and back on the same team. But however it started, we are now getting this unprecedented view inside what it's like in these private investigation activities on behalf of the Church of Scientology, and I'm glad we're getting to see it. Likewise. As always, as always, it's great to talk to you, Tony. Look forward hey man, to this a is fun. Podcast. I enjoyed it. Yeah, it yeah. is. We haven't, I don't think we've ever done a podcast. We've been uh, amigos for so long, but we've, uh, it's, it's good to do a podcast, <laughs> and we need to do more. We need to well, do we'll more. See. We'll so see. We'll, keep, we'll, 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 keep up, we'll keep We'll keep up to date. And for Surviving Scientology Radio, this is your host, Jeffrey Augustine. Always glad to be with you. Thank you for listening. And as always, we'll be in very good touch.